Chapter two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter two. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Danton, Camille Desmoulins, Fabre d'Eglantine. The scenes at the Cordelier, at which I was three or four times present, were ruled and presided over by Danton, a Hun with the stature of a Goth, flat nosed, with wide nostrils, broad face, and the expression of a gendarme mingled with that of a slippery and cruel attorney. In the nave of his church, Danton, with his three male furies, Camille Desmoulins, Marat, and Fabre d'Eglantine, organized the assassinations of September bio de varenne proposed to set fire to the prisons and burn all who were within them another member of the convention recommended drowning all who were in custody marat declared in favour of a general massacre the author of the circular of the common council he invited the friends of liberty to repeat in the departments the enormities perpetrated at the carmelites and in the abbey let us examine the page of history sixtus v for the salvation of mankind compared the devotedness of jacques clement to the mystery of the incarnation as marat was compared to the saviour of the world charles the ninth wrote to the governors of the provinces to imitate the massacre of st bartholomew as danton gave orders to the patriots to take example by the murders of september the jacobins were plagiarists they gave a proof of this by immolating louis the sixteenth after the example of charles the first as crimes are found mixed up with great social movements it has been most improperly represented that these crimes produced the great benefits of the revolution of which they were only the hideous imitations impassioned or systematic minds admire nothing in a noble nature under suffering except the convulsion danton more frank than the english used to say we will not bring the king to trial we will kill him and of the priests he said these priests these nobles are not guilty but they must be put to death because they are out of their place impede the course of events and embarrass the future this language has the appearance of a horrible depth but it has no real character of genius for it supposes innocence to be nothing and that moral order may be separated from political order without destroying it which is false danton had no real conviction of the principles which he maintained he merely wrapped himself up in the mantle of the revolution in order to make his fortune come ball with us was his advice to a young man when you have enriched yourself then you can do as you please he acknowledged that he did not devote himself to the cause of the court because they were unwilling to give his price this was the effrontery of an intelligence acquainted with its own power and of corruption proclaimed with open mouth inferior even in ugliness to mirabeau whose agent he had been danton was superior to robespierre without having like him lent his name to crimes he preserved some sense of religion we have not said he destroyed superstition in order to establish atheism his passions may have been good from the fact alone of their being passions we ought always to pay some regard to the characters of men's minds in forming a judgment of their actions criminals of imaginative minds like danton from the very fact of the exaggeration of their sayings and deportment appear more perversely wicked than those who are cold-blooded although they are really less so this remark too applies to a whole people taken collectively the people is the poet author and zealous actor in the piece in which it plays or which it is made to play its excesses are not so much the instinct of a natural cruelty as the delirium of a multitude inebriated with sights especially of a tragical nature a thing so true that in all popular horrors there is always something superfluous added to the picture and the emotion danton was caught in the snare which he had laid it proved of no use to him to throw pellets of bread in the faces of his judges to answer their questions with courage and nobleness to cause the tribunal to hesitate to put the convention in danger and fear to reason logically upon the crimes by which the very power of his enemies had been created and seized with a fruitless repentance to cry out it was i who established this infamous tribunal i ask pardon for the deed from god and men a phrase which has been pillaged more than once he should have made this declaration respecting the infamy of the tribunal before being called to its bar nothing now remained for danton but to show himself as unfeeling with respect to his own death as he had been with regard to that of his victims 
to carry his head higher than the suspended sword this he did from the scaffold of the reign of terror where his feet were covered with the clotted blood shed the previous evening having cast a look of contempt and pride on the multitude he said to the executioner you will show my head to the people it is worth the trouble danton's head remained in the hands of the executioner whilst the headless trunk went to mix with the decapitated bodies of his victims this was still equality danton's deacon and subdeacon camille desmoulins and fab d'eglantine perished in the same manner as their priest at the time in which grants were made to the guillotine and when people wore alternately at their buttonhole disguised as a flower a little golden guillotine or a very small portion of the heart of some one who had been guillotined at the time in which men shouted vive l'enfer in which joyful orgies of blood steel and rage were celebrated when men drank to annihilation and in complete nakedness danced the dance of the dead not to have the trouble of undressing when they went to join the departed at this time a man must sooner or later arrive at the last banquet at the last jest of sorrow desmoulins was called before the tribunal of fouquier tinville and what is your age asked the president the age of jesus christ the sans culotte replied camille playing the buffoon a sort of avenging constraint compelled these cutthroats of christians unceasingly to confess the name of jesus it would be unjust to forget that camille desmoulins dared to brave robespierre and by his courage to redeem his crimes he gave the signal for a reaction against the reign of terror a young and beautiful woman full of energy by rendering him capable of love rendered him capable of virtues and sacrifices indignation raised the intrepid and biting irony of the tribune to the rank of eloquence in a bold and haughty strain he assailed the use of the scaffold which he had contributed to raise suiting his conduct to his words he would not agree to his own punishment he struggled with the executioner in the hurdle and only arrived at the brink of the last gulf half torn to pieces fab d'eglantine author of a piece which will survive exhibited a character the very reverse of desmoulins of pitiable weakness jean rousseau the executioner in paris at the time of the league ordered to be hung for having lent his aid to the assassins of president brisson could not resolve to submit to the rope it appears that a man does not learn to die by putting others to death the debates of the cordelier furnish me with a view of a condition of society in the most rapid moments of its transformation i had seen the constituent assembly commence the murder of royalty in seventeen eighty nine and seventeen ninety i found the dead body of the old monarchy still warm given up in seventeen ninety two to gut-spinning legislators they eviscerated and dissected it in the vaults of their clubs just as the halberdiers cut in pieces and burned the body of balafre in the ruins of the castle of blois of all the men whose names i have here recalled danton marat camille desmoulins fab d'eglantine and robespierre not one is now alive i met with them for a moment on my passage between a new springing society in america and a dying system in europe between the forests of the new world and the solitudes of exile i had only been some months upon a foreign soil and these lovers of death were already exhausted by it at the distance at which i now am from their apparitions it appears to me that having descended into hell in my youth i have a confused recollection of the ghosts which i met wandering about on the banks of the cositus they complete the varied dreams of my life and are now to be inscribed on the tablets of my posthumous memoirs End of chapter two chapter three of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter three london from april till september eighteen twenty two monsieur de malesherbes opinion on the emigration it was a great gratification to me again to meet m de malesherbes and to talk to him about my former plans i entered into the details of a journey which i intended should occupy nine years previously however i would make a hurried visit to germany i would hasten to the army of the princes then return to crush the revolution all this was to be accomplished in two or three months and i would then hoist my sail and return to the new world freed from a revolution and having got a wife and yet my zeal outran my faith i felt persuaded that emigration was a great folly like pelaudet every way says montaigne with the gibelin i was guelph with the guelph gibelin 
my slight attachment to absolute monarchy prevented me from acting under any illusion in the determination to which i came i had some scruples and although i was resolved to sacrifice myself for what i looked upon as a point of honour yet i wished to have the opinion of m de malesherbes on the emigration question i found him very much excited the crimes perpetrated before his eyes had destroyed the political toleration of this friend of rousseau between the executioners and their victims he did not hesitate which side to take he thought that anything would be better than the then existing state of affairs and in my particular case he said that no man wearing a sword could dispense with joining the brothers of his king oppressed and delivered up to his enemies he quite approved of my return from america and urged my brother to set out with me i stated the usual objections about the alliance with foreigners the interests of one's native country etc etc he answered them and passing from general reasons to particular details cited several embarrassing examples he recalled to my memory the guelphs and ghibelins strengthening their several parties by the troops of the emperor and the pope and in england the barons taking up arms against john lackland and to conclude he instanced in our own times the republic of the united states imploring the assistance of france thus we see continued m de malesherbes that men the most devoted friends of liberty and philosophy who were republicans and protestants saw no culpability in borrowing such aid as might give the victory to their party without our gold our ships and soldiers would the new world be now emancipated i myself who now address you did i not in seventeen seventy six receive franklin who came to renew the negotiations begun by silas dean and yet franklin was no traitor was the liberation of america less honourable because it had been aided and assisted by lafayette and french grenadiers every government which instead of guaranteeing the fundamental laws of society transgresses itself the laws of equity and the rules of justice by so doing ceases to exist and restores man to the state of nature self-defence is then allowable it is lawful to have recourse to such means as seem most proper for the overthrow of tyranny and re-establishing the rights of each and of all the principles of natural justice advanced by the greatest civilians developed by such a man as m de malesherbes and supported by numerous historical examples struck my mind but without convincing me in yielding to them i in reality was guided merely by the feelings natural to my age and the punctilios of honour to these instances given by m de malesherbes i shall add a few of more recent date during the war in spain in eighteen twenty three the republican french party embraced the cause of the cortes and felt no scruple about bearing arms against their country in eighteen thirty and eighteen thirty one the poles and the italian constitutional party solicited assistance from france and the portuguese of the chart invaded their native land with the money and troops of the foreigner we have two standards of weight and measure we approve in relation to one idea one system one interest one man what we blame in relation to another idea another system another interest another man end of chapter three chapter four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rené de chateaubriand chapter four london from april till september eighteen twenty two i play and lose adventure of the hackney coach madame roland barrere at rousseau's hermitage second federation of the fourteenth of july preparations for emigration these conversations between the illustrious adherent of the king and myself took place at the house of my sister-in-law her second son had just been born m de malesherbes stood godfather to him and gave him his own name christian i was present at the baptism of this child whose only sight of his parents was destined to be at an age when life leaves no trace on the memory but appears in after years like the distant shadow of a dream the preparations for my emigration in the meantime proceeded my friends had thought to secure me a good fortune by my marriage but it was now found that my wife's fortune was in church property which the nation undertook to pay after its own fashion madame de chateaubriand had besides with the consent of her guardians lent the title to a great proportion of her income to her sister the countess du plessis pascal now an emigre there was still then a deficiency of money and it was found necessary to borrow some 
a notary procured us ten thousand francs i was carrying them home with me in assignats when i met in the rue de richelieu one of my former comrades in the regiment of navarre count achard he was a great gambler he proposed that we should go together to the m rooms where we could talk more comfortably my evil genius urged me on i went played and lost all except fifteen hundred francs with which full of remorse and shame i flung myself into the first vehicle i met i had never gambled play produced a sort of painful intoxication in me and if the passion for it had once seized me it would certainly have turned my brain in a state of half distraction i got out of the carriage at saint sulpice and left behind me the pocket-book containing the poor fragment of my treasure i hastened home and said i had left the ten thousand francs in a hackney coach i went out again down the rue dauphine and over the pont neuf not without an inclination to throw myself into the river as far as the square of the palais royal where i had taken the unlucky conveyance there i questioned the savoyards who watered the horses and described the carriage they indicated a number at a guess the police commissary of the quarter informed me that the vehicle bearing that number belonged to a letter out of conveyances at the far end of the faubourg saint denis i set off and stayed all night in the stables awaiting the return of the vehicles first came a great number none of which was the one i wanted but at length at two in the morning came my equipage i had scarcely time to recognise the two white horses when the poor beasts broken down stiff and wearied fell down on the straw with their legs stretched out as if they were dead the driver remembered my having hired him after me he had driven a citizen who had been set down at the jacobin club after the citizen a lady whom he had set down in the rue de clary number thirteen after this lady a gentleman whom he had taken to the franciscan convent rue saint martin i promised a trifling reward to the driver and under his guidance set out as soon as it was day to track my fifteen hundred francs something in the way i had gone to discover the north-west passage it appeared plain to me that the citizen of the jacobin club had confiscated them in right of his sovereignty the lady in the rue de clary assured me she had seen nothing in the coach i now reached the third and last station entirely hopeless of success the driver described the gentleman as well as he could to the porter of the convent oh that is father so and so cried he he then led me through the deserted galleries and rooms into one where i found a franciscan the only inhabitant of that large building and he merely remaining to make an inventory of the furniture of his convent this monk seated on a heap of ruins in a dusty garment listened attentively to my tale are you said he the chevalier de chateaubriand i answered in the affirmative here replied he is your pocket-book i had found your address in it and should have brought it to you after i had finished my work thus it was a despoiled and persecuted monk driven from his home and yet occupied in conscientiously making an inventory of what remained in his cloister for his proscribers who restored to me in these fifteen hundred francs the means of proceeding into exile had i never recovered this little sum i should not have emigrated what would have become of me my life's course would have been entirely changed now i would not go one step out of my way to pick up a million this adventure occurred on the sixteenth of june seventeen ninety two faithful to my instincts i had returned from america to offer my sword to louis the sixteenth not to involve myself in party intrigues the disbanding of the king's new guard in which was murat the successive ministries of roland du mourier and du port du tertre the petty court conspiracies or great popular movements only filled me with ennui and contempt i heard madame roland much talked of but did not see her her memoirs give evidence that she possessed extraordinary strength of mind she was said to be very agreeable whether sufficiently so as to make the cynicism of unnatural virtues tolerable is doubtful certain it is that the woman who at the very foot of the guillotine called for ink pen and paper to set down the discoveries which she made on her way from the conciergerie to the place de la revolution showed a preoccupation of mind and a disdain of life of which we have few examples madame roland possessed character rather than genius the former may give the latter the latter cannot give the former on the nineteenth of june i had gone to the valley of montmorency to visit j j rousseau's hermitage not that i found any pleasure in recollections of madame d'epinay and the factitious and depraved circle around her but i desired to bid adieu to the retreat of a man whose manners and mind were in strong opposition to my own although he was gifted with a genius whose voice had powerfully moved my youthful mind the next day the twentieth i was still at the hermitage and there met with two men wandering like myself in these deserted haunts during the day which told the knell of monarchy indifferent as they were or as i thought they would be to the affairs of the world 
the one was Monsieur Marais of the Empire, the other Monsieur Barret of the Republic. The gentle Barret had retired thither from the noise and tumult in his sentimental philosophy to address sweet little revolutionary sonnets to the shade of Julie, the troubadour of the guillotine, in reference to whom the convention decreed that la terre était à l'ordre du jour, only escaped the murderous grasp of this same terror by hiding himself in the basket for the heads, and from the depths of this bloody receptacle under the very scaffold he was only heard to croak la mort barret belonged to that species of tiger which oppian describes as formed from the light breath of the wind velocis zephyri proles ganguené and chamfort my old acquaintances in the literary world were charmed with the proceedings of this twentieth of june la Harpe, continuing his lessons at the lyceum cried in a stentorian voice madman you replied to all the representations of the people bayonets bayonets well now you have them although my voyage to america had made me a less insignificant personage i was utterly unable to rise to such a transcendent height of principle and eloquence fontaine was in rather a precarious situation in consequence of his former connection with the societe monarchique my brother belonged to a club of enragés the prussians were on their march in virtue of an agreement between the cabinets of vienna and berlin a rather warm engagement had already taken place between the french and austrians near mont it became imperatively necessary to determine on a course my brother and i procured false passports for lille we were two wine merchants national guards of paris wearing the uniform and intending to contract for provisioning the army my brother's valet louis poulain nicknamed st louis travelled under his own name he was going to see his relations in flanders although they lived at his native place lombard in brittany our departure was fixed for the fifteenth of july the day after the second federation we spent the fourteenth in the garden of tivoli with the rosambo family my sisters and my wife tivoli belonged to m boutin whose daughter had married m de Malzerbe. towards the close of the day we saw a number of federalists wandering about pell-mell with the sentence pétion ou la mort written in chalk on their hats tivoli my point of departure into exile was to become a rendezvous for games and fetes our relations parted from us cheerfully they were persuaded that we were merely going on a pleasure excursion my recovered fifteen hundred francs seemed a treasure sufficient to bring me back in triumph to paris End of chapter four chapter five of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter five london from april till september eighteen twenty two i emigrate with my brother adventure of st louis we cross the frontier on the fifteenth of july at six in the morning we got into the diligence my brother and i had secured places in the coupe beside the driver the valet whom we were supposed not to know ensconced himself in the body of the carriage among the other travellers st louis was a somnambulist he used to go to fetch his master at night in paris with his eyes open but sound asleep he undressed my brother and assisted him to bed still fast asleep and replied to everything that was said to him during these attacks je sais je sais the only way to waken him was to throw cold water in his face he was a man about forty nearly six feet high and as ugly as he was tall the poor man had never served any other master than my brother and was impressed with a profound respect for him and he was terribly disturbed when at supper he had to sit at the same table with us his fellow-travellers talking patriotically of hanging up aristocrats a la lanterne increased his terror and the idea that after going through all this he must cross the austrian army and go and fight for the princess completed the derangement of his brain he drank a great deal and got into the diligence again we resumed our places in the coupe in the middle of the night we were startled by cries from the centre of the diligence some of the travellers putting their heads out at the window shouted stop stop then came a confusion of voices male and female get out citizen get out get down brute you cannot stay here he is a brigand get out get out we alighted also and saw st louis all scared thrown out of the diligence getting up again he stared round with his open somnambulistic eyes and then set off at full speed and without a hat in the direction of paris we could not call him back as we should have betrayed ourselves we were therefore obliged to leave him to his fate he was stopped and apprehended at the first village he came to and declared that he was valid to monsieur le comte de chateaubriand and that he lived in paris rue de bondy 
the patrol sent him from division to division to president rosambo and this unfortunate man's depositions served to prove our emigration and to send my brother and sister-in-law to the scaffold next morning at the general breakfast we had the pleasure of hearing the whole history twenty times over the man's imagination was entirely disturbed he dreamed aloud and said the strangest things he was doubtless a conspirator an assassin flying from justice the well-behaved citoyenne blushed and agitated their great fans of green paper a la constitution we easily recognised in these accounts the mingled effects of somnambulism fear and wine on arriving at lille we sought out the person who was to get us across the frontier the emigration had its agents of safety who in the end proved to be agents of perdition the monarchical party was still powerful the question in suspense and the weak and cowardly were contented we left lille before the gates were shut we then stopped at a retired house and did not set out on our way till ten o'clock when night was quite fallen we carried nothing with us but a little cane it was not more than a year since i followed my dutchman in the same style through the american forests we went through fields of corn across which wound paths but slightly traced the french and austrian patrols were scouring the country we might fall into the hands of one or the other or suddenly find ourselves close to the pistol of a vedette we caught glimpses every now and then at some distance of single horsemen motionless on their posts with arms ready for use we heard the tread of horses sounding in hollow ways and putting our ears to the ground could distinguish the regular sound of infantry marching after proceeding for about three hours sometimes running sometimes going slowly on tiptoe we reached a cross-road in a wood where some late nightingales were singing suddenly a company of soldiers who had been concealed behind a hedge rushed upon us with drawn sabres we cried we are officers going to join the princes and demanded to be taken to tournay declaring that we had the means of making ourselves known the command of the post placed us among his horsemen and carried us off when the day dawned the men perceived our uniform of national guards beneath our greatcoats and insulted the colours which france was soon to make vassal europe wear it was in the tournessi the primitive kingdom of the franks that clovis resided during the first years of his reign he left tournay with his companions when he was called to the conquest of gaul arms attract all rights to themselves says tacitus through this town from which the first king of the first race went out in the year four hundred and eighty six to found his long and powerful dynasty i passed in seventeen ninety two on my way to join the princes of the third race on a foreign soil and again in eighteen fourteen on my way back when the last king of the french quitted the kingdom of the first king of the franks omnia migrant on arriving at tournay i led my brother to encounter the authorities and under the garb of a soldier visited the cathedral in the olden time otho of orleans teaching canon of this cathedral had sat during the night before its entrance demonstrating the motions of the planets to his disciples and indicating with his finger the milky way and the different stars i should have been better pleased to find this simple astronomer at tournay than pandour i have great taste for those old times of which the chronicles tell such things as that in the year ten forty nine in normandy a man was metamorphosed into an ass a thing which as has been seen was very near happening to me under the tuition of the demoiselle coupa my instructors in the art of reading hildebert in the year eleven fourteen noticed a girl with heads of corn springing from her ears serious perhaps the river meurs which i was soon about to cross was seen suspended in the air in the year eleven eighteen witness william of nangy and alberic rigord assures us that in the year eleven ninety four between compiegne and clermont in the district of beauvais there fell a shower of hail mingled with crows carrying lighted coals which set fire to what they fell on the tempest according to jervis of tilbury could not extinguish a candle placed on the window-sill of the priory of st michael of camisa he also tells us of a pure and beautiful fountain existing in the diocese of uzes which changed its place whenever anything unclean was thrown into it consciences in the present day are not so easily troubled reader i am not losing time as you may perhaps think i am chatting with you to prevent your being impatient during my brother's long negotiation here he is at last he has succeeded in explaining himself to the satisfaction of the austrian commandant and permission is granted us to go to brussels an exile purchased with too much care and trouble End of chapter five chapter six of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, 
Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 6. London from April till September, 1822. Brussels. Dinner at the Baron de Breteuil. Rivarol. Departure for the Royal Army. Route. Meet with the Russian Army. Arrival at Trev. Brussels was the headquarters of the most distinguished emigres, the most elegant women, and the most fashionable men of Paris, who could only take the field as aide de camp, expected from pleasure the rewards of victory. They had new and handsome uniforms, in which they exhibited themselves to show the extent of their absurdity and folly. They consumed, on the festivities of a few days, sums of money considerable enough to have maintained them for some years. It was not worth while to economise, seeing they would be almost immediately in Paris. These brilliant chevaliers were preparing for military glory by successes in love, following precisely the opposite mode of ancient chivalry. They looked with contempt upon us poor fellows on foot, with our knapsacks on our backs. Small provincial gentlemen become soldiers. At the feet of their omphales, these Herculeses twirl the distaffs which they had sent to us, and which we, contenting ourselves with our swords, returned to them. At Brussels I found my trifling baggage, which had arrived before me. It consisted of my uniform of the regiment of Navarre, a few changes of linen, and my precious notebooks, from which I could never separate. I was invited to dine along with my brother at the Baron de Breteuil. There I met the Baroness de Montmorency, then young and beautiful, but at the present time just dying, and martyr bishops with mohair cassocks and crosses of gold, young magistrates turned into colonels of hussars, and Rivarol, whom I never saw but this once in my life. His name had not been announced. I was struck with the language of a man, who alone talked, and with some right claimed a hearing like an oracle. Riverall's wit was injurious to his talents, his words to his pen. On this occasion he said very aptly of revolutions, The first blow is aimed at a god, the second only strikes against insensible marble. I had resumed the dress of a shabby sub-lieutenant of infantry, and on leaving the dinner-table was about to set out. My knapsack was behind the door. I was still bronzed by the rays of an American sun, and the sea breezes. I wore my black hair smooth. My figure and my silence annoyed Riverol, and the Baron de Breteuil, who perceived his restless curiosity, satisfied it. Where does your brother, the Chevalier, come from? said he to my brother. I answered, From Niagara. Riverol exclaimed, From the falls. I was silent. He stammered the beginning of a question. Monsieur is going to the war, said I, interrupting him. We rose from dinner. These coxcomb emigres were hateful to me. I was eager to see my peers, emigres like myself, with six hundred livres income. We were very stupid, doubtless, but at least our swords were ready, and had we obtained success, the benefits of the victory would not have fallen to us. My brother remained at Brussels, with the Baron de Montboissier, to whom he was attached as an aide-de-camp. I set out alone for Coblenz. Nothing can be more historical than the road I followed, Every place as I pass recalls some of the splendid triumphs of France. I pass through Liège, one of those municipal republics, which was accustomed so often to rebel against its bishops, or against the counts of Flanders. Louis XI, when an ally of the men of Liège, was compelled to consent to the sack of their city, in order to escape from his ridiculous imprisonment at Peron. I was going to rejoin and form a part of those men of war, who placed their glory in similar things. In 1792, the relations between Liège and France were more peaceable. The abbot of Saint-Hubert was obliged every year to send two hunting-dogs to the successors of King Dagobert. At Aix-la-Chapelle, another gift, but on the part of France. The pole which was used at the interment of a most Christian king was sent to the tomb of Charlemagne as liege pole to a feudal superior. Our kings thus rendered faith and homage by taking possession of the inheritance of eternity. They swore at the knees of the dead, their lady, to be true and faithful, after having given the feudal kiss. But this was the only suzerainty to which France ever yielded homage as a vassal. The cathedral of Aix-la-Chapelle was built by Charlemagne and consecrated by Leo the Third. Two prelates were wanting at the ceremony, who were replaced by two bishops of Maastricht, long since dead, but resuscitated expressly for the occasion. Charlemagne, having lost a beautiful mistress, pressed the body in his arms, and would not be separated from it. This passion was attributed to a charm. The dead body of the young lady was examined, and a small pearl was found under the tongue. The pearl was thrown into a marsh. Charlemagne, madly enamoured of the marsh, gave orders to have it filled up. 
there he built a palace and a church the one to dwell in during life and the other to be his resting-place when dead the authorities for this story are archbishop turpin and petrarch at cologne i was struck with admiration at the cathedral had it been finished it would be the noblest gothic monument in europe the monks alone were the painters sculptors architects and masons of their temples and cementarius master mason was a title of which they boasted it is curious in the present day to hear philosophical pretenders and blustering democrats declaim against the clergy as if those surplus labourers those mendicant orders to whom we owe almost everything had been gentlemen cologne recalled to mind caligula and st bruno i saw the remains of the dykes of the former at by and the desolate cell of the latter at the grand chartreuse i went up the rhine the whole way to coblenz confluentia the royal army was no longer there i crossed those empty kingdoms in ania regna i saw the beautiful valley of the rhine the tempe of the barbarian muses in which knights appeared around the ruins of their castles or where at night sounds of arms were heard when war was portending between coblenz and treves i fell in with the prussian army i passed along the column and when i reached as far as the guards i saw they were marching in order of battle with cannon in line the king and the duke of brunswick occupied the centre of a square formed by frederick's old grenadiers my white uniform caught the king's eye he sent for me he and the duke of brunswick took off their hats and in my person saluted the old french army they asked me my name that of my regiment and where i was going to join the princes the military reception affected me i replied that having learned in america the misfortunes of my king i had returned to shed my blood in his service the generals and officers who surrounded frederick william made signs of approbation and the russian monarch said to me sir it is always easy to recognize the sentiments of the french nobility he again took off his hat remained uncovered and stopped till i had disappeared behind the mass of grenadiers now the emigres are declaimed against as tigers who tore out the heart of their mother at the time of which i speak they were held up as examples and honour was held in as much regard as country in seventeen ninety two fidelity to oaths was looked upon as a duty it has now become so rare as to be considered a virtue a strange scene which has occurred to others as well as myself was very near making me retrace my steps i was almost refused admittance into the army of the princes when i at length reached it at treves i was one of those men who waited for the event before coming to a determination i ought to have been in the camp three years ago i had just come when victory was certain there was no need of such persons as myself there were already too many gallant men after the fight whole squadrons of cavalry were deserting daily the very artillery went away en masse prodigious illusion of parties i was fortunate enough to meet with my cousin armand de chateaubriand who took me under his protection called a meeting of the bretons and pleaded my cause i was sent for and explained myself i said i had just come from america to have the honour of serving with my comrades that the campaign was merely opened and not begun and that i was time enough for the first fire that moreover i would withdraw if they required it but after having obtained satisfaction for an undeserved insult the matter was arranged as i was a good fellow the ranks were open to receive me and my only remaining difficulty was the embarrassment where to choose End of chapter six chapter seven of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter seven army of the princes roman amphitheatre atala henry the fourth shirts the army of the princes was composed of gentlemen classed according to provinces and serving as common soldiers the nobility were tracing up their lineage to its origin and to the origin of the monarchy at the very moment in which that origin and that monarchy were on the eve of closing their career as an old man returns to childhood there were besides several brigades of emigre officers from various regiments become common soldiers among this number were my comrades of navarre under the command of their colonel the marquis de Mortemar. i would have been greatly tempted to enrol myself with la martiniere if he could still have been in love but armorican patriotism prevailed i entered the seventh company of the bretons under the command of monsieur de goyon minia the nobility of my province had furnished seven companies 
and there was an eighth formed of young men belonging to the tiers etat the iron-grey uniform of this last company differed from that of the other seven which was royal blue with ermine facings thus men attached to the same cause and exposed to the same dangers perpetuated their political inequalities by odious distinctions the true heroes were the plebeian soldiers who had no personal interest to prompt the sacrifice of their services our little army consisted of infantry composed of soldiers of noble birth and officers four companies of deserters dressed in the different uniforms of the regiments from which they had come one company of artillery some engineer officers with a few pieces of cannon bombs and mortars of various calibre the artillery and engineers who almost to a man embraced the cause of the revolution contributed greatly to the success of its arms a fine body of german cavalry of musketeers under the command of the old count de montmorin and naval officers from brest rochefort and toulon supported our infantry the general emigration of the officers of the navy threw the maritime power of france completely back into that weakness from which louis the sixteenth had rescued it never since the days of duquesne and tourville had our fleets obtained greater glory my comrades were full of joy whilst i had tears in my eyes when i saw these dragoons of the ocean passing before us no longer commanding the ships with which they had humbled the english and delivered america instead of going to discover new continents to unite them as appendages to france these companions of la perouse were plunging into the muddy roads of germany they mounted the horse consecrated to neptune but they had changed their element and the land was not their sphere in vain their commander carried at their head the flag of the bell pool a holy relic of the white flag from the tatters of which there still hung honour but from whence victory had fallen we had tents but were in want of everything else our guns of german manufacture were good for nothing of frightful weight which fretted our shoulders and were often in a condition not to go off i went through the whole campaign with one of these muskets the hammer of which would not fall we remained two days at treves it was to me a great source of pleasure to visit the roman remains and after having seen the nameless ruins of the ohio to stand amidst a city so often sacked of which salwan said fugitives of treves do you seek for theatres do you demand a circus from your chiefs for what state i pray you for what people for what city theatra igitur quiritis circum a principibus postulatis qui quae so statui qui populo qui civitati fugitives of france where was the people for whom we wished to re-establish the monuments of st louis i sat down with my gun in the midst of the ruins and drew from my knapsack the notes of my travels in america i laid the separate pages on the grass around me read over and corrected a description of a forest a passage of atala amidst the wreck of a roman amphitheatre thus making preparations to go and reconquer france i then packed up my treasure the weight of which joined to that of my shirts my caps tin can wicker bottle and my little homer made me spit blood i tried to thrust a tallow along with my useless cartridges into my pouch my companions laughed at me and tore away the sheets which lapped over both sides of the leather covering providence came to my aid having slept one night in a hayloft on awaking i no longer found my shirts in my knapsack but my notebooks had been left behind i thank god that accident by assuring my renown saved my life for the sixty leaves which lay between my shoulders would have given me an affection of the chest how many shirts have i said henry the fourth to his valet de chambre sire answered he there is still a dozen of the torn ones and pocket-handkerchiefs haven't i eight at present there are only five the bernese gained the battle of ivry without shirts i have not been able to restore the kingdom to his descendants by losing mine End of chapter 7chapter eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter eight london from april to september eighteen twenty two a soldier's life last representation of old military france the order of march was given for thionville we went five or six leagues a day the weather was desperate we marched in rain and mud singing as we went o richard o mon roi o pauvre jacques on arriving at our place of encampment we had neither wagons nor provisions 
but were obliged with the asses which followed the columns like an arabian caravan to seek for something to eat in the farmhouses and villages we paid for everything with scrupulous punctuality i was nevertheless subjected to punishment for having thoughtlessly taken two pears from the garden of a chateau a great bell a great river and a grand seigneur says the proverb are bad neighbours we pitched our tents by accident we were obliged continually to beat the canvas in order to enlarge the threads so as to prevent the water from coming through the allowance was ten men to a tent each of whom in his turn acted as cook one went for meat another for bread another for wood and a fourth for straw i had a great talent for making soup and received the compliments of my companions especially when i mixed up with it some milk and cabbage after the fashion of brittany among the iroquois i had learned to brave smoke so that i contrived to get on well round my fire made with green and wet branches this soldier's life is very amusing i fancied myself still among the indians when eating our mess under the tent my companions used to ask me for stories of my travels and they paid me in kind we all lied like a corporal in a wine-shop with a conscript paying his reckoning one thing fatigued me washing my linen it was however necessary to be done and that very often for the obliging thieves had left me but a single shirt borrowed from my cousin armand besides the one which i had on when engaged in soaping my stockings pocket-handkerchiefs and my only shirt on the bank of a stream with my head down and my back up i was constantly seized with giddiness the movement of my arms caused me intolerable pain in the chest i was obliged to sit down amongst the watercresses and the grass and in the midst of the commotions of war to watch the flowing of the peaceful waters lopez de vega had his bandage of love washed by a shepherdess this shepherdess would have been very useful to me for a little turban made of the inner bark of the birch tree which i had received from the floridan women an army is generally composed of soldiers somewhat about the same age the same size and the same strength ours was altogether different a confused assemblage of old men children not long out of their nursery and a general jargon the dialect of normandy brittany picardy auvergne gascony provence and languedoc a father served with his son a father-in-law with his son-in-law an uncle with his nephew a brother with a brother a cousin with his cousin this motley crowd ridiculous as it appeared had something honourable and affecting in its nature because it was animated by sincere convictions it presented a picture of the old monarchy and a last representation of classes of men which were passing away i have seen gentlemen of a severe countenance with grey hair torn clothes knapsacks on their backs and their guns slung dragging themselves along by the help of a stick and assisted by the arm of one of their sons i have seen m de boishu the father of my comrade who was massacred at the states of rennes close beside me marching along sorrowful and alone his bare feet in the mud and carrying his shoes on the point of his bayonet for fear of wearing them out i have seen young men wounded lying under a tree and a priest in a riding coat and stole kneeling by their head and sending them to st louis whose descendants they were making an effort to defend the whole of this poor crowd without receiving a single sou from the princes carried on the war at their own cost whilst decrees were despoiling them of their all and throwing their wives and mothers into jails the old men of the former time were less unfortunate and less isolated than those of the present day if when surviving they lost their friends little else was change strangers to youth they were not so to the usages of society now a linger in the world has not only seen men die but ideas also principles tastes pleasures pains and sentiments nothing bears any resemblance to what he has known it is a new and different species of the human race in the midst of which he brings his days to a close nevertheless let france of the nineteenth century learn to estimate that old france to which she owed so much the present will become old in its turn and will be accused as it accuses the past of entertaining superannuated notions it is their fathers whom they have conquered let them not deny those from whose blood they have sprung had they not been nobly faithful to the usages of the olden time the men of the present age would not have drawn from their national fidelity that energy which has led to their glory in the new age between the two frances there is nothing more than a transformation of virtues End of chapter 8chapter nine of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter nine london april to september eighteen twenty two commencement of the siege of thionville 
the chevalier de la baronnet close beside our indigent and obscure camp was one brilliant and rich at the staff officers quarters nothing was to be seen but wagons filled with provisions the place was crowded with cooks valets and aides-de-camp nothing could better represent the court and the province the monarchy expiring at versailles and the monarchy dying among the wilds of Dijesclin. the aides-de-camp had become odious to us on the occurrence of any engagement at thionville we cried forward aides-de-camp as the patriots cried forward officers i felt a weight at my heart when coming one gloomy day within sight of forests bordering the horizon we were told that these forests were in france the act of crossing the frontier of my native land in arms had an effect upon me which i cannot describe i had a sort of prophetic feeling a revelation of the future the more so as i did not share any of the illusions of my comrades either as regarded the cause in defence of which they were engaged or the triumph they flattered themselves with the hope of obtaining i was like falkland in the army of charles i there was not a chevalier of la manche in our army though he might be an invalid lame and with his head covered by a nightcap under the three-cornered hat who did not firmly believe himself able with his single arm to put to flight fifty vigorous young patriots this respectable and complacent pride the source of prodigies at another period had not taken possession of my mind i did not feel so convinced of the prowess of my invincible arm we arrived without defeat at thionville on the first of september for we had met no one on the way the cavalry encamped to the right the infantry to the left of the high road leading to the town from the german side the fortress was not in sight from our position but about six hundred paces off was the crest of a hill from which there was a view into the valley of the moselle the marines connected the right flank of our infantry with prince waldeck's austrian corps and the left flank was covered by a body of cavalry of the maison rouge and the royal allemand eighteen hundred strong we entrenched ourselves in front by a ditch along which were ranged the stands of arms the eight breton companies occupied two transverse streets of the camp and below us lay the company of the officers of navarre my comrades the works which occupied three days being completed monsieur and the count d'artois arrived and reconnoitred the place which was vainly summoned to surrender although wimpfen appeared to be inclined to give it up we had not gained the battle of rocroi like the great conde and therefore could not take possession of thionville but we were not defeated beneath its walls like ferquieres we took up a position on the public road in part of a village forming a sort of suburb to the town and outside the hornwork which defended the moselle bridge shots were fired from house to house our men retained possession of those they had taken i was not present at this first engagement my cousin armand behaved well in it while the skirmish was going on in the village my company was ordered to the erection of a battery on the skirts of a wood which clothed the summit of one of the neighbouring hills the slope of this hill was covered with vines down to its foot where it met the plain adjoining the exterior fortifications of thionville the engineer who directed us made us throw up a cavalier or mound covered with turf on which our cannon were to be planted in a parallel line with it we dug an open trench to place us below the bullet range the erection of the terraces proceeded slowly for we officers were all young and old little accustomed to handle the shovel and mattock we had no wheelbarrows and had to make use of our coats instead of bags to carry the earth in the fire of a lunette opened upon us and annoyed us the more as we could not return it two eight-pounders and a howitzer whose range was too short to be of any use being the whole of our artillery the first ball we sent from our howitzer fell outside the glacis and excited the derisive shouts of the garrison a few days afterwards we were reinforced by austrian cannon and cannoneers a hundred infantry and a picket of marines were relieved every four and twenty hours at this battery the besieged prepared to make an attack on it we could see with the glass considerable movement on the ramparts at nightfall a column issued from one of the posterns and gained the lunette under shelter of the covered way my company was ordered up as a reinforcement at the battery at daybreak five hundred or six hundred patriots began the action in the village on the high road above the town then turning to the left crossed the vines to take our battery in flank the company of marines charged bravely but was routed and exposed us we were too alarmed to return the fire and march forward with fixed bayonets the assailants retired for what reason i know not had they held firm they would have driven us from the post in this action we had several wounded and some killed among the latter was the chevalier de la baronne captain of one of the breton companies i was an evil genius to him the ball which killed him rebounded from the barrel of my musket and struck him with such force that it went through both temples and crushed the brain noble and useless victim of a hopeless cause 
when marshal d'aubeterre held the states of brittany he went to the house of monsieur de la baronne the father a poor gentleman living at dinard near st malo the marshal who had begged him to invite no one perceived on his entrance that the table was laid for twenty-five people and amicably reproved his host monseigneur said monsieur de la baronne there are none here but my own children he had twenty-two sons and one daughter all by the same marriage the revolution mowed this rich family harvest before it had time to ripen end of chapter nine chapter ten of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter ten london april to september eighteen twenty two continuation of the siege contrasts saints in the woods battle of bouvines patrol unexpected meeting effect of a bullet and of a bomb waldeck's austrian corps now began its operations our attack became warmer it was a fine sight at night pot granados illuminated the works which were covered with soldiers sudden gleams of brilliancy struck the clouds or the blue sky when the match exploded the cannon and the bombs crossing one another's path in the air described parabolas of light in the intervals of the detonations might be heard the roll of the drum bursts of military music and the voices of the hostile parties on the ramparts of thionville and on our posts unhappily in both camps the cry was in french sentinelle prenez garde à vous if the engagements took place at dawn the hymn of the lark succeeded to the roll of musketry and the now noiseless cannon gaped silently at us from their loopholes the bird song bringing recollections of a pastoral life to the mind seemed to utter reproach it gave me the same feeling when i encountered some victims of war among the flowering clover or by a running stream which bathed the tresses of the dead in the woods at a few paces distance from the horrors of war i found little statues of the virgin and of various saints a goatherd a shepherd or a beggar carrying his wallet on their knees before these peacemakers told their beads to the distant thunder of the cannon a whole parish once came with its pastor to offer bouquets to the patron of a neighbouring parish whose shrine was in a grove facing a fountain the curate was blind a soldier of religion he had lost his sight in its service like a grenadier on the field of battle the vicar administered the communion instead of his curate because the latter could not see to place the sacred host on the lips of the communicants during this ceremony and from the depths of his darkness the curate blessed the light our fathers believed that the patron saints of hamlets jean le silentier dominique l'encuirassé jacques lantessy paul le simple bar l'ermite and many others were no strangers to the triumphs of the arms by which harvests are protected on the very day of the battle of bouvines robbers entered a convent at auxerre of which saint germain was the patron and stole the sacramental vessels the sacristan presented himself before the shrine of the beatified bishop and said to him groaning meanwhile germain where wert thou when these brigands dared to violate thy sanctuary and a voice issuing from the shrine replied i was near Cisoin, not far from the bridge of bouvines engaged with other fellow-saints in aiding the french and their king to whom a brilliant victory has been given by our help qui fuit auxilio victoria prestita nostra we held battue in the plain and carried them as far as the hamlets to the very foot of the exterior fortifications of thionville the village on the great trans moselle road was unceasingly taken and retaken twice i was present at these engagements the patriots treated us as enemies to liberty aristocrats satellites of capet we call them brigands cutthroats traitors and revolutionists sometimes the engagement was suspended while a duel took place in presence of the hostile bands now become impartial witnesses strange characteristic of the french which not even violent passions can stifle one day i was on patrol in a vineyard at about twenty paces from me was an old gentleman chasseur who kept striking the vines with the butt-end of his gun as if to start a hare and then looked briskly about in the hope of seeing a patriot start out every one there had his own ways another day i went to visit the austrian camp between this encampment and that of the naval officers acting as cavalry lay the ridge of a wood upon which the enemy were very inappropriately directing their fire they were too lavish of their volleys the garrison believed us to be stronger than we really were which explains the pompous bulletins of the commandant of thionville as i was crossing this wood i saw something move among the grass 
I went nearer and saw a man extended on the ground with his face downwards, so that nothing was to be seen but a broad back. I supposed him to be wounded, and taking him by the nape of the neck partly raised his head. He opened his scared eyes and lifted himself a little resting on his hands. On catching sight of his face I burst out laughing. It was my cousin Moreau, whom I had not seen since our visit to Madame Chatenay. He had thrown himself on his face at the descent of a bomb, and had found it utterly impossible to get up again. I had great trouble in getting him on his feet, for he had grown three times as corpulent as he was when I had last seen him. He informed me that he served in the commissariat department, and was then on his way to make an offer of some cattle to Prince Waldeck. He wore a rosary. Hugo Mittel speaks of a wolf who had a desire to enter the monastic state, but not being able to accustom himself to the meagre fare, he became a canon. As I was re-entering the camp, an officer of engineers passed close to me, leading his horse by the bridle. A ball struck the animal at the narrow part of the shoulder and cut completely through it. The head and neck remained hanging to the rider's hand, and pulled him to the ground by their weight. I had seen a bomb fall just in the middle of a circle of officers who were taking their mess together. The mess bowl disappeared. The officers, knocked over and covered with dust, cried like the old sea captain, Fire to starboard, fire to larboard, fire everywhere, fire in my wig! These singular accidents appear to belong to Thionville. In 1558, Francis of Guise besieged the place. Marshal Strozzi was killed while speaking in the trench with the said Sieur de Guise, who at the moment had his hand on his shoulder. End of chapter 10《11 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3. By Francois René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 11. London, April to September, 1822. The Camp Market. A kind of market had been formed behind our camp. The peasants had brought quarter casks of white mazelle wine, which remained on the wagons. The horses were unyoked and fed quietly, attached by a string to one end of the cart, while people drank at the other. The fires for bat fowling gleamed here and there. Sausages were fried in saucepans, puddings boiled in basins, pancakes tossed on iron plates, and omelettes raised on baskets. Cakes covered with aniseed, rye loaves a penny apiece, cakes of Indian meal, green apples, red and white eggs, pipes and tobacco were sold beneath a tree from whose branches hung coarse cloth caps, bargained for by the passers-by. Peasant girls, seated astride on wooden stools, were employed in milking cows. Everyone gave his cup and awaited his turn. Sutlers in their blouses, soldiers in their uniforms, hovered about the ovens. Vivandier passed hither and thither, calling out in French and German. Some stood in groups, others were seated round deal tables, standing unevenly on the rough ground. Various inventions for shelter were made some with a piece of packing-cloth, others with branches cut in the forest, as on Palm Sunday. I think, too, that there were weddings performed in the covered wagons, in remembrance of the Frankish kings. The patriots might easily have followed the example of Majorian, and carried off the chariot containing the bride. Rapid esera victor, nubentemque nurum. The people sang, laughed, and talked, and the scene was extremely gay at night, lighted up by the fires gleaming on the ground, and the stars shining overhead. When I was neither on guard at the batteries, nor on service in the tent, I was fond of supping at this fair. There all the camp stories were revived, the battles fought over again, but embellished by good cheer and merriment, their attraction was much increased. One of our comrades, a brevet captain, was celebrated for his faculty of story-telling. I have forgotten his real name as we gave him that of Dinazad, and always called him by it. It should have been Scheherazade, but we were not so particular. As soon as we caught sight of him, we ran to him and disputed him among ourselves. It was a contest who should get him into the MS. Dinazad was a short man, with long legs, a fallen-in face, gloomy moustachios, eyes whose pupils had a decided preference for the outward angle, a hollow voice, a large sword with a light brown scabbard, and the air of a military poet, a serious and solemn joker who never laughed at anything, and at whom one could not look without laughing. He was a witness to all the duels, and the love of all the ladies at the Countess. He took everything he said in a tragic light, and only interrupted his narrative to drink with the same air from a bottle, to rekindle his pipe, or to swallow a sausage. One night, when a small fine rain was falling, we formed ourselves into a circle near the tap of a cask, which leaned over towards us on a cart, whose shafts were in the air. A candle fastened to the cask lighted us, and a piece of coarse cloth, 
stretched from the shafts of the cart to two posts, served us as a roof. Dinazad, with his sword awry in the fashion of Frederick the Second, standing between the wheel of the cart and the side of a horse, related a story to our great satisfaction. The vivandier, who brought us our allowance, remained to listen to our Arab, and the attentive group of Bachantes and Silenuses, who formed the chorus, accompanied the narrative with marks of surprise, approbation, or disapproval. Gentlemen, said the orator, you all knew the Green Knight, who lived in the time of King John. Yes, yes, replied the chorus. Dinazad gulped down a rolled pancake and burned himself. This Green Knight gentleman was, as you must know, since you have seen him, extremely handsome. When the wind blew back his red hair over his helmet, it looked like a wreath of hemp round a green turban. Bravo! cried the chorus. One evening in May he blew his horn at the drawbridge of a castle in Picardy, or Auvergne, no matter which. In this castle lived La Dame de Grand Compagnie. She received the knight well, the attendants removed his armour, and conducted him to the bath. The lady then sat down with him to a magnificent repast, but she ate nothing, and the attendants were dumb. Oh, oh, groaned the chorus. The lady gentleman was tall, thin, and ungainly, like the major's wife, but she had a great deal of expression and a coquettish air. When she laughed and showed her long teeth below her short nose, it was so enchanting that one would not know what he was about. Well, the lady fell in love with the knight, and the knight with the lady, although he was afraid of her. Dinazad here emptied the ashes of his pipe on the wheel, and was about to replenish it, but the company, eager for the story, obliged him to go on. The green knight, quite in a desperate state, resolved to quit the castle, but before his departure he demanded an explanation of several very strange things from the lady, and made her a formal offer of marriage, providing she was not a sorceress. Dinazad's rapier was planted straight and stiff between his knees, Seated below him and leaning forward, we made a kind of circle of sparks round him with our pipes, resembling the ring of Saturn. Suddenly he cried out, as if beside himself, Now, gentlemen, this dame de grand Pont compagnie was death. And the captain, breaking the ranks and crying, Death! Death! put the vivandier to flight. The sitting was closed. The applause was loud and the laughter prolonged. We returned to our post, nearer Thionville, to the sound of its cannon. End of chapter 11《ラプトゥーヴァーズ・シャトーブリオン1768-1800 Part 3》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee.《ラプトゥーヴァーズ・シャトーブリオン1768-1800 Part 3》by François René de Chateaubriand Chapter 12 London, April to September 1822 A Night by the Trench Dutch Dog Recollection of the Martyrs, My Companions at the Outposts, Eudorus, Ulysses. The siege continued, or rather there was no siege, for we did not open the trenches and we had not troops enough regularly to invest the place. Intelligence from other quarters was reckoned upon, and news was expected of the success of the Prussian army, or of that of Clairfait, with which was the Duke of Bourbon's French corps. Our small resources were becoming exhausted, and Paris seemed to grow more distant. The bad weather was unceasing. We were insulated in the midst of our labours. I awoke sometimes in a ditch with water up to my neck, and next day I was unable to do anything. Among my fellow countrymen who were in the army was Ferrand de la Sigonnière, my old class fellow at Dinan. We slept in the same tent and were by no means comfortable. Our heads, getting beyond the canvas, received the rain from the tent as from a sort of spout. I got up and went with Ferrand to walk by the trench in front of the encampment. For all our nights were not as merry as those spent in the company of Dinazad. We walked in silence, listening to the voices of the sentinels, and watching the lights in the streets of tents, as we had formerly watched the lamps in our corridors at college. We talked of the past and of the future, of the faults which had been and would be committed. We deplored the blindness of the princes, who thought to return to their country with a handful of followers, and fix the crown on their brother's head by the arm of the foreigner. I remember having said to my comrade in one of these conversations that France was following the example of England, that the king would perish on the scaffold, and that probably our attempt on Thionville would be made one of the principal heads of accusation against Louis the Sixteenth. Ferron was struck with my prediction. It was the first I had ever made. Since that time I have made many, as true and as unheeded. When the evil arrived, others took shelter and left me to struggle with the misfortune I had foreseen. When the Dutch are caught in a gale of wind out at sea, they retire into the hold of the ship, close the hatches, and drink punch, 
leaving a dog on deck to bark at the tempest the danger passed they send back fidel to his berth in the hold and the captain comes up to enjoy the fine weather on the poop i was the dutch dog in the vessel of legitimacy the recollections of my military life are graven in my memory i have traced them in the sixth book of the martyrs an armorican barbarian in the camp of the princes i carried homer with my sword i preferred my country the poor little island of aaron to the hundred cities of crete i said with telemachus the barren country which supports only goats is pleasanter to me than those which rear horses my words would have made the candid menelaus agathos menelaus laugh End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirteen london from april to september eighteen twenty two passage of the moselle engagement Liver, the deaf and dumb girl, attack upon Thionville. A report at length gained ground that an action was about to be fought. The Prince of Waldeck was to try an assault, whilst we, having crossed the river, should make a diversion by a false attack on the place from the French side. The party ordered on this service consisted of five Breton companies, mine included, the company of the officers of Picardy and Navarre, and the regiment of volunteers composed of young peasants from Lorraine, and deserters from different regiments. This force was to be supported by the Royal Germans, some squadrons of musketeers, and various corps of dragoons, which were to cover our left. My brother was in this cavalry division with the Baron de Montboissier, who had married a daughter of Monsieur de Mazer, a sister of Madame de Rothambeau, and consequently my sister-in-law's aunt. We escorted three companies of Austrian artillery with very heavy guns, and a battery of three mortars. Orders were given to march at six o'clock in the evening. At ten the troops crossed the Moselle, above Thionville, by means of copper pontoons. Amena fluenta, subte labentia tacita rumore Moselle, Ausonius. At break of day we were in order of battle on the left bank. The heavy cavalry were placed on the wings and the light cavalry in front. On our second movement we formed in columns and began to file off. About nine o'clock we heard the sound of firing to the left. An officer of carboneers at full speed, came to inform us that a detachment of Kellermann's army was close at hand, and that the action had already commenced between the respective parties of light infantry. The officer's horse had been struck by a bullet in the forehead. He reared and dashed out the foam from his mouth and blood from his nostrils. This carbineer, sword in hand upon a wounded horse, was a grand sight. The troops which had come from Metz were manoeuvring to take us in flank. They had with them several field pieces, whose fire told severely upon our volunteer corps. I heard the cries of some recruits who had been struck, the last cries of youth snatched away in the vigour of life. The sounds filled me with compassion as I thought on the poor mothers. The drums beat the charge and we rushed in disorder upon the enemy. We approached so near each other that notwithstanding the smoke, the terrible countenances of men ready to shed our blood could be distinctly seen. The patriots had not yet acquired that bearing which is only gained by a long familiarity with engagements and victory. Their movements were slow and irresolute. Fifty grenadiers of the old guard would have easily routed a heterogeneous mass of old and young undisciplined nobles. A thousand to twelve hundred infantry were struck with alarm at the fire of a few discharges from the heavy artillery of the Austrians. They retreated. Our cavalry pursued them for two leagues. A deaf and dumb German girl called Libba, or Libba, had become attached to my cousin Armand and followed him. I found her seated upon the grass, which stained her dress with blood, she sat with her elbow supported by her bent and raised knees and her head leaning on her hand which was passed under her fair dishevelled hair she wept as she gazed at three or four dead bodies now deaf and dumb which lay scattered around her she had not heard the noise of the cannon the effects of which were before her she did not hear the sighs which escaped from her lips when she looked at armand she had never heard the voice of him whom she loved had the two merely contained silence she would have gone down to the grave unconscious of being there Moreover, fields of carnage are everywhere. In the eastern cemetery at Paris, 27,000 tombs, 230,000 bodies, will teach you what a battle death is waging night and day at your doors. After a halt of some length, we resumed our march, and arrived by nightfall under the walls of Thionville. 
The drums were no longer beaten, the word of command was given in a low tone. With a view to check a sortie, the cavalry moved quietly along the high roads and hedges to the very gates of Thionville, against which we were to open a cannonade. The Austrian artillery, protected by our infantry, took up a position at a distance of fifty yards from the advance works behind some gabions shouldered up in a hurry. At one o'clock in the morning of the 6th of September, a signal was given by a rocket thrown up from the camp of the Prince of Waldeck at the other side of the town. The Prince opened a continuous fire, which was vigorously answered from the town. We immediately opened our fire. The besieged, not thinking that we had any troops in that direction, and not having expected an attack from that quarter, had nothing on the ramparts to the south. We had not long to wait. The garrison mounted a double battery, which soon drove through our defences and dismounted two of our guns. The sky was in a blaze, and we were buried in clouds of smoke. I had the good luck to be a little Alexander. Worn out with fatigue, I was in a deep sleep, almost under the wheels of the gun carriages, where I was on guard. A splinter from a shell, which had ploughed up the ground six inches, struck me on the right thigh. Roused by the stroke, but not being sensible of the pain, I only saw that I was wounded by the appearance of the blood. I bound up my thigh with my pocket-handkerchief. During the affair on the plain, the ball struck my knapsack, whilst in the act of wheeling. Atala, like a devoted daughter, placed herself between her father and the enemy's ball. She remained to sustain the fire of the Abbe Moyolet. At four o'clock in the morning, the Prince of Ardeck's fire ceased. We thought the town had surrendered. But the gates were not open, and we were now obliged to think of a retreat. We returned to our positions, after a harassing march of three days. The Prince of Ardeck had advanced to the very edge of the ditch which she had attempted to clear, hoping to secure a surrender by means of a simultaneous attack. The impression was that there were divisions within the town, and they flattered themselves that the royalist party would bring the keys to the prince. The Austrians, having fired without sufficient shelter, lost a considerable number of men, and one of the Prince of Waldeck's arms was shot away. Whilst these drops of blood were shed under the walls of Thionville, torrents were flowing in the prisons of Paris. My wife and my sisters were in greater danger than myself. End of chapter 13《ハトブリオン1768-1800》Chapter 14 of the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee.《Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 3, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 14. Raising the Siege, Entry into Verdun, Sickness among the Prussians, Retreat, Smallpox. We relinquished the siege of Thionville and set out for Verdun, surrendered to the Allies on the 2nd of September. Longwy, the native town of François de Mercy, had fallen on the 28th of August. The passage of Frederick William was attested on all sides by garlands and crowns. In the midst of these trophies of peace, I observed the Prussian eagle displayed on the fortifications of Vauban. It was not to remain there long. As for the flowers, they were destined speedily to fade like the innocent creatures who had gathered them. One of the most atrocious murders of the Reign of Terror was that of the young girls of Verdun. Fourteen young girls of Verdun, of rare beauty, and almost like young virgins dressed for a public fete, were, says Rieuf, led in a body to the scaffold. They soon faded away and were cut down in their spring. On the day after their immolation, the Cour des Femmes had the appearance of a flower garden, desolated by a storm. I never saw amongst us any despair like that which this act of infamous cruelty excited. Verdun is celebrated for its sacrifices of women. According to Gregory of Tours, Deuteric, wishing to conceal his daughter from the pursuits of Theodebert, caused her to be placed in a tumbrel, harnessed to two wild oxen, and driven headlong into the mares. The instigator of the massacre of the young girls of Verdun was the poetess de regicide, Pont de Verdun, who was filled with fiendish enmity to his native city. It is almost incredible that the Almanac de Muse should have furnished agents for the reign of terror. The vanity of mediocrity in a state of suffering produced as many revolutionists as the wounded pride of cripples and abortions, a rebellion alike of the infirmities of the mind and those of the body. Pons gave to his dull epigram the point of a poniard. Apparently faithful to the traditions of Greece, the poet was desirous of offering in honour of his gods nothing but the blood of virgins, for the convention, on his reports, declared that no pregnant woman should be put on trial. He also caused a sentence passed on Madame de Bonchamp, widow of the celebrated Vendée in general, to be rescinded. 
alas we other royalists in the suite of the princes suffered the same reverses as the vendeans but without having shared in their glory we had not at verdun to pass the time that famous countess de saint balmont who after having laid aside female attire to assume that of a man mounted on horseback and acted as an escort to the ladies who accompanied her and whom she had left in the carriage we were not impassioned in favour of the ancient gaul and did not write letters in the language of amadis ah no the sickness which affected the prussians was communicated to our little army i was attacked by it our cavalry had gone to join frederick william at valmy we had no knowledge of what was passing and from hour to hour were expecting orders to advance we were however commanded to beat a retreat being extremely weakened and the annoyance of my wound not suffering me to march except with great pain i dragged myself along as i best could in the rear of my company which speedily disbanded jean balu the son of a miller in verdun left the house of his father when very young in the company of a monk who loaded him with his wallet on going out of verdun according to Sumer's, the colline du gay verdunum i carried the wallet of the monarchy but i have neither become controller of finance bishop nor cardinal if in the novels which i have written i have sometimes touched on my own history in the histories i have related i have often drawn scenes from the history of life in which i was an actor thus in the life of the duc de berry i have sketched some scenes which actually took place under my own eyes when an army is broken up the men return to their homes but what homes had the soldiers of conde's army where was the stick to guide them which they had been hardly permitted to cut in the woods of germany after having laid down the gun which they had taken up for the defence of their king it was necessary to separate brethren in arms said their last farewell and went their different ways upon the earth before setting out all went to pay their respects to their father and their captain the aged conde with his white hair the patriarch of glory gave his blessing to his children wept over his scattered tribe and saw the tents of his camp struck with the vexation of a man who looks upon his paternal home crumbling into ruins less than twenty years afterwards bonaparte the chief of the new french army also took leave of his companions so quickly do men and empires pass away the most extraordinary renown is not safe from the most ordinary destiny we left verdun the rains had made the roads heavy and on every side were to be seen wagons tumbrils and cannon fixed in the mire vivandier with their children on their backs and soldiers dead and dying on the ground in crossing some rough ground i sank up to my knees ferron and another of my comrades extricated me notwithstanding my prayers to be left there as i was ready to die Monsieur de goyon miniac the captain of my company delivered to me a very honourable testimonial on the sixteenth of october at the camp near longwy at arlon we saw upon the high road a file of baggage wagons the horses were dead some being held upright some forced down upon their knees and others with their heads to the ground and their carcasses remained fixed between the shafts they might have been considered as the shades of a battle bivouacking on the banks of the styx Ferron asked me what I intended to do, and I replied, If I can reach Ostend, I shall embark there for Jersey, where I shall find my uncle de Bede. From thence I shall be able to rejoin the royalists in Brittany. The fever undermined my strength, and I sustained myself with the greatest difficulty upon my swollen legs. I also suffered under the attacks of another disease. The smallpox attacked me. After suffering from nausea and vomiting for four and twenty hours, an eruption broke out all over my body which appeared and disappeared alternately according to the state of the atmosphere in this condition i commenced on foot a journey of two hundred leagues with no more than eighteen livres tournois in my pocket all for the glory of the monarchy ferron who had lent me my six three-franc pieces being expected at luxembourg separated from me End of chapter fourteen Chapter fifteen of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter fifteen. London, from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Revised in February, eighteen forty five. The Ardennes. Going out of Arlon, I met with a peasant, 
who gave me a lift in his car for four sous and put me down on a heap of stones five leagues distant from our starting place having hobbled along a few paces by the aid of my crutch i washed the linen of my scratch now become a sore in a brook which ran by the roadside this did me great good the smallpox had come completely out and i felt myself greatly relieved i had never given up my knapsack the fastenings of which galled my shoulders my first night i passed in a barn and ate nothing the wife of the peasant who was owner of the barn refused to take any money for my lodging and at break of day she brought me a large basin of cafe au lait with a piece of black bread which i relished exceedingly so refreshed i gaily resumed my journey although i often fell down i was rejoined by four or five of my comrades who relieved me of my knapsack although they too were ill we met with villagers by cart after cart for five days we had got far enough into the ardennes to reach Atert, flamizoul and bellevue on the sixth day i was again alone the smallpox was becoming white and gradually falling away after having walked two leagues which cost me six hours time i perceived a family of gypsies with two goats and an ass encamped behind a ditch and sitting round a fire of sticks i had scarcely arrived when i sank down and these singular creatures made haste to render me aid a young woman in rags lively brown and headstrong sang leapt and wheeled about holding her child across her bosom like a hurdy-gurdy with which she would have given life to the dance then she sat down on her heels directly opposite examined me curiously by the light of the fire and asking me for a petit sou took hold of my dying hand to tell my fortune it was too dear it would have been difficult to show more science grace and misery than fell to the lot of this sibyl of the ardennes i know not when the nomads of whom i should have been a worthy son left me when i roused from my stupor at daybreak i found them no longer there my good fortune-teller had gone away with the secrets of my future life in her keeping in exchange for my petit sou she had left an apple near my head which served to refresh my mouth i shook myself like jean au lapin among the thyme and the dew but i could neither feed nor run nor leap playfully around i rose nevertheless intending to pay my court to aurora she was very beautiful and i very ugly her rosy face announced her good health she was better than the poor cephalus of armorica although both young yet were we old friends and i pleased myself by thinking that that morning her tears were for me i plunged into the forest no longer very melancholy solitude had restored me to nature i carolled the romance of the unfortunate cazotte tout au beau milieu des ardennes et un château sur le haut d'un rocher etc etc was it not in the keep of this castle of phantoms that philip the second of spain imprisoned my fellow-countryman captain la noue whose grandmother was a chateaubriand philip consented to release the illustrious prisoner if the latter would agree to have his eyes scooped out la noue was so eager to return to his dear brittany that he was just on the point of accepting the conditions alas i was full of the same desire and to deprive me of my sight nothing more was needed than an illness with which it had pleased god to afflict me i did not meet with sir enguerrand venant d'espagne but with some poor unfortunate foreign peddlers who like myself carried all their goods upon their backs a woodman with new pieces of felt was entering the wood he might have taken me for a dead branch and cut me down some rooks larks and yellow hammers ran along the road or sat motionless on the tops of the stones carefully watching the hawk which was hovering around in the air from time to time i heard the sound of the swineherd's trumpet looking after the sows and their young ones among the oaks i stopped to take some rest in a shepherd's movable hut there was no master in the place except a kitten which offered me a thousand caresses the shepherd remained standing at a distance in the centre of an open space with his dog stationed at different distances around the sheep by day the herdsman gathered simples for he was a physician and sorcerer by night he watched the stars and was a chaldean shepherd i took up my next station a quarter of a league further on the feeding ground of a herd of deer huntsmen were passing at the extremity a fountain bubbled up at my feet at the bottom of a fountain in the same forest rolando in amorato not furioso saw a crystal palace full of ladies and knights had the paladin who rejoined the brilliant naiads at least left behind breed d'or at the edge of the spring or had shakespeare sent me rosalind and the exiled duke they would have brought seasonable aid having recovered my breath i continued my route my ideas floated vaguely through my mind not without their charm 
my old fantasies with scarcely the consistence of shadows three parts effaced surrounded me to bid adieu i no longer possessed recollection at an indefinite distance i saw a confused mixture of unknown images the airy forms of my relations and friends when i sat down by the wayside i thought i saw faces smiling at me from the threshold of distant cabins in the blue smoke escaping from the roofs of the thatch huts in the tops of the trees the brightness of the clouds in the luminous rays of the sun piercing the fogs like a golden wand these apparitions were the shadows of the muses coming to be present at a poet's death my tomb scooped out by the mountings of their lyres under an oak in the ardennes would have been perfectly suitable to a soldier and a traveller some pullets which had lost their way among the forms of the hares under the privets together with the insects caused some murmurs around me lives as fickle as unknown as my life i could proceed no further i felt extremely ill the smallpox struck in and was stifling me towards the close of day i stretched myself on my back on the ground in a ditch my head supported by the knapsack of atala my crutch by my side and my eyes fixed upon the sun whose rays faded with my vision with all the sweetness of my thoughts i saluted the star which had shone upon my early youth in my native plains we went to rest together it to arise more glorious i to all appearance never more to awake i swooned away with a feeling of religion the last noise i heard was the fall of a leaf and the whistling of a bullfinch End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter sixteen london from april till september eighteen twenty two wagons of the prince de ligne women of namur i find my brother at brussels our last parting i must have remained nearly two hours in a state of insensibility the prince de ligne's wagons came by one of the drivers stopping to cut a birch switch stumbled over me he supposed me dead and gave me a push with his foot which produced some sign of life he called his companions and moved by an impulse of pity with their aid lifted me into one of the wagons the jolting brought me to my senses i spoke to the men and told them that i was a soldier belonging to the army of the princes and that if they would take me to brussels i would reward them for their trouble very well comrade replied one of them but you must get down at namur because we are forbidden to take any one in the wagons we will wait for you at the other side of the town i requested a drink and swallowed a few drops of brandy which again brought the symptoms of my malady to the surface and relieved my chest for a short time nature had endowed me with extraordinary strength of constitution about ten in the morning we arrived in the suburbs of namur i alighted and followed the wagons at some distance but soon lost sight of them at the gate of the town i was stopped and while my papers were being examined i sat down under the archway the soldiers on guard at sight of my uniform offered me a fragment of munition bread and the corporal gave me some brandy in a blue glass mug seeing that i hesitated to drink from the cup of military hospitality take it cried he in anger accompanying his injunction with a sacrament de teufel my walk through namur was a weary one i dragged myself along supporting myself against the houses the first woman who saw me quitted her shop gave me her arm with an air of compassion and assisted me to walk i thanked her and she replied no thanks soldier other women soon joined us bringing bread wine fruit milk soup old clothes and coverings of various kinds he is wounded said some in their flemish french patois he has the smallpox cried others hurrying away the children but young man you cannot walk you will die remain at the hospital they wished to take me to the hospital they relieved each other from door to door and thus assisted me to the town gate outside which i found the wagons i have before spoken of a peasant woman who aided me in my need i shall soon have to speak of another who took care of me at guernsey o oh, women who assisted me in my hours of distress if ye are still living may god comfort you in your old age and in your griefs if ye have quitted this world may your children share the portion of happiness so long denied me by heaven these women helped me to climb into the wagon recommended me to the driver and forced me to accept a woollen coverlet i perceived that they treated me with a sort of respect and deference in a frenchman's nature there is something superior and refined which is immediately recognised by other nations the prince de ligne's people once more set me down at the gate of brussels and refused to take my last three-franc piece 
no innkeeper in the town would receive me the wandering jew that popular orestes whom the poem brings to brussels quand il fut dans la ville de bruxelles en brabant was better received than i for he always had five sous in his pocket i knocked the door was opened but at sight of me they cried go on go on and shut the door in my face i was even driven from a coffee-house my hair fell in disorder over my face half concealed by my beard and mustachios round my thigh was twisted a wisp of hay and over my tattered uniform i wore the coverlet given me by the women of namur knotted at my throat after the manner of a cloak the beggar in the odyssey was more impudent than i but not so poor i had first presented myself at the hotel where i had formerly lodged with my brother but in vain i now made a second attempt and as i came up to the door saw the count de chateaubriand just getting out of a carriage accompanied by the baron de montboissier he was quite frightened at the spectral appearance i presented the master of the hotel absolutely refused to receive me and a room was sought elsewhere a barber offered a paltry lodging suited to my miserable condition my brother brought a surgeon and a doctor he had received letters from paris and an invitation from m de malesherbes to return to france he told me of the events of the tenth of august of the massacres of september and other political news of which i had not heard a word he approved of my intention of going to jersey and lent me twenty-five louis d'or my weakened sight scarcely enabled me to distinguish my unfortunate brother's features i believed that the darkness emanated from myself while in reality it was the shadow of eternity encompassing him we were unconsciously looking on each other for the last time no human being can while he lives count on the possession of more than the present moment the next is in the hands of god there are always two chances against our reunion with the friend from whom we part our death or his how many men have never again ascended the stairs they have gone down death touches us more before than after the decease of a friend such a death is as it were a part of ourselves being detached a world of recollections of childhood family intimacies common interests and affections dissolving my brother was the first-born of my mother he sat before me by the paternal hearth he waited several years to receive me to give me my name and to become entwined with my youth my blood had it been mingled with his in the revolutionary vase would have resembled it as milk produced from pasture on the same mountain has a similar flavour but if men have prematurely deprived my elder brother my godfather of his head years will not spare mine my brow is already being despoiled of its ornament i feel an ugolino time leaning over me and gnawing my brain com pan per fame al manduca end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter seventeen london from april till september eighteen twenty two ostend passage to jersey i am set ashore at guernsey the pilot's wife jersey my uncle bedes and his family description of the island the duc de berry loss of relations and friends the misfortune of growing old i cross to england my last meeting with jerian the doctor was in a state of great astonishment he looked upon the smallpox which came out upon me and then suddenly disappeared at intervals coming to none of its natural crises and yet not being fatal as a phenomenon of which his science offered no example mortification had begun in my wound it was dressed with peruvian bark having received these necessary attentions i persisted in setting out for ostend brussels was hateful to me i longed to quit it it was filling again with the carpet heroes returned from verdun in their carriages i did not find them in brussels when i followed the king during the hundred days i had an easy journey to ostend by the canal and there i found some breton companions in arms we hired a decked boat and dropped down the channel we slept in the hold on the large stones which served as ballast my strength of constitution was at last exhausted i could not speak the heavy swell of the sea completed my helplessness i could barely swallow a few drops of water or lemon juice occasionally and when the bad weather obliged us to put into guernsey they thought i was going to expire an emigrant priest read the prayers for the dying over me the captain not wishing that i should die on board his boat ordered me to be lifted out on the quay there they seated me in the sun with my back leaning against a wall and my face turned towards the sea 
in sight of that isle of alderney near which eight months before i had been face to face with death under another form i was apparently destined to meet with compassion in every distress an english pilot's wife happened to pass she was moved with pity at sight of my condition and called her husband who with the aid of two or three sailors carried me the friend of the waves to their little fisherman's cot and laid me on a good bed with snow-white sheets the sailor's wife took every possible care of the stranger i owe my life to her next day i was again taken on board my hostess almost wept on parting from me women have a celestial impulse of tenderness for misfortune my sweet-looking fair-haired nurse whose face resembles some that we see in old english engravings pressed my swollen and burning hands between her cool and delicate ones i felt ashamed to bring such misfortune and misery into contact with so many charms we set sail again and reached the western point of jersey one of my companions m de Thiel, went on to my uncle's house at st hellier and my uncle sent him back in a carriage next day to fetch me we crossed the whole island and even in my dying state i was charmed with its wooded scenery but i had fallen into a state of delirium and only talked of my delight in raving rhapsodies for four months i hovered between life and death my uncle his wife his son and his three daughters relieved each other in their watch by my pillow i occupied an apartment in one of the houses which were then being built along the port the windows of my room reached to the ground and from my bed i could look upon the sea the doctor m de Lattre, had forbidden any conversation with me on serious matters and particularly on politics in the latter end of january seventeen ninety three seeing my uncle enter the room in deep mourning i trembled for i thought we must have lost some member of our family he told me of the death of louis the sixteenth i was not surprised i had foreseen it i then made inquiries about my relations my sisters and my wife had returned to brittany after the massacres there were over they had had a great deal of difficulty in getting out of paris my brother had returned to france and retired to malzerbe i now began to leave my bed the smallpox was gone but i still suffered from my chest and from a weakness which i long retained jersey the caesarea of antonius itinerary has been subject to english dominion ever since the death of robert duke of normandy france has several times attempted to take possession of it but has always failed the island forms as it were a fragment of our primitive history the saints who came from hibernia and albion to armorica rested on their way at jersey st hellier lived a hermit among the rocks of caesarea the vandals murdered him a sample of the old normans is to be found at jersey one might imagine they heard the language of william the bastard or of the author of the romain de roux the island is fertile it contains two towns and twelve parishes and is covered with country houses and flocks the ocean breeze whose steeds seem to belie its rude breath gives to jersey exquisite honey cream of extraordinary sweetness and butter of a deep yellow smelling of violets bernardin de st pierre supposes that the apple tree came to us from jersey but in this he is mistaken we owe the apple and the pear to greece as we do the peach to persia the lemon to media the plum to syria the cherry to Sarasant, the chestnut to castano the quince to sidon and the pomegranate to cyprus in the beginning of may i was able once more to go out and these first walks gave me great delight spring in jersey retains all its youth and freshness it might there still be called by its ancient name primavera a name which in its old age bequeathed to its daughter its earliest flower i will here transcribe two pages from the life of the duke de berry it is relating mine at the same time after twenty-two years of combat the iron barrier which enclosed france was broken the hour of the restoration was approaching our princes quitted their retreats each of them repaired to a different point of the frontier like those travellers who seek at the risk of their lives to penetrate into some country of which wondrous tales are related monsieur left for switzerland the duc d'angouleme for spain and his brother for jersey in this island where some of charles the first judges died in obscurity the duc de berry found french royalists grown old in exile and forgotten for their virtues as the english regicides had been for their crimes he met with old priests henceforth consecrated to solitude and realized thus the fiction of the poet who makes a bourbon land in the island of jersey after a storm one of these confessors and martyrs might have said to the heir of henry the fourth as the hermit of jersey is made to say to the great monarch himself loin de la cour alors dans cette grotte obscure de ma religion je viens pleurer l'injure en riade 
The Duke de Berry passed several months at Jersey. Sea, wind and policy kept him prisoner there. Everything thwarted his impatience. He was on the point of renouncing his enterprise and embarking for Bordeaux. A letter written by him to Madame la Maréchale Moreau gives us a clear idea of his occupations at Jersey. February 8, 1814. I am here, like Tantalus, within sight of that unhappy France, which has so long struggled to break its chains. You, whose soul is so high, so French, can imagine what my feelings are, how much it would cost me to tear myself from the shores which I could now reach in two hours. On a bright day I go to the highest point I can find, and with my glass in my hand trace the whole coast. I see the rocks of Coutances. My imagination carries me away. I see myself leaping to land, surrounded by Frenchmen with white cockades in their hats. I hear the cry, Vive le roi! A cry never heard with indifference by Frenchmen. The loveliest woman in the province throws a white scarf around me, for love and glory always go together. We march on Cherbourg, a miserable fort with a garrison of foreigners attempts a defence. We take it by storm, and a vessel is dispatched to fetch the king, over which floats the white flag, recalling the days of France's glory and happiness. Ah, madam, when one is within a few hours' voyage of so probable a dream, can one think of leaving it behind? It is three years since I wrote the above at Paris. I had preceded the Duke de Berry by twenty-two years in Jersey, that abode of exiles, and was destined to leave my name in it, as Armand de Chateaubriand married in the island, and his son Frederick was born there. Their former joyous disposition had not abandoned my uncle de Bede's family. My aunt still fondled a large dog, a descendant of the one whose virtues I have related. As he bit every one, my cousins had him hung secretly, notwithstanding his nobility. Madame de Bede was of opinion that some English officers, struck with Azor's beauty, had stolen him, and that he was then living in the richest mansion in the three kingdoms, loaded with honours and good cheer. Our present gaiety was, unfortunately, only drawn from our gaiety of times past. While retracing the scenes of Montbois, we found subjects of amusement at Jersey. Such a circumstance is rather rare, for, in the human heart, pleasures do not preserve the same intimate links and associations with each other as griefs. New joys do not restore the springtime to former ones, but recent griefs revive those long past in all their vividness. One consolation was that the emigres then excited general sympathy. Our cause appeared the cause of European order. It is something for misfortune to be an honoured one, and ours was so. M. de Bouillon protected the French refugees at Jersey. He dissuaded me from my design of going over into Brittany, unfit as I was for a life in caves and woods, and advised me to go to England and there seek an opportunity of entering regular service. My uncle, who was but ill provided with money, now began to feel somewhat embarrassed with his large family. He had been obliged to send his son to London to live there in misery and hope. Fearing to become a burden to Monsieur de Bedet, I resolved to free him of his charge. Thirty-four Louis d'Or, brought me by a smuggling vessel from Saint-Malo, enabled me to execute my design, and I took my place in the packet-boat for Southampton. I was deeply affected at bidding my uncle farewell. He had tended me with paternal affection. With his image were connected the few happy moments of my childhood. He knew every one whom I loved and in his countenance I could trace some resemblance to my mother. I had left that excellent mother, and was never more to see her. I had bid farewell to my sister Julie, and to my brother, and was destined never to see them again. I was now leaving my uncle, and his cheerful countenance would never more gladden my eyes. A few months had sufficed for all these losses, for the death of our friends is not to be reckoned from the moment they die, but from that in which we cease to live in their society. If we could say to time, Hold! we should bid it stand still at our hours of youth and enjoyment. But as this is not in our power, let us not sojourn here below. Let us take flight before we are deserted by our friends, and by those years which in the poet's idea were alone worthy of life. Vita digno etas. What enchants us in our days of friendship and love becomes in old age when we are neglected and deserted, an object of suffering and regret. We no longer wish for the return of the smiling months, we rather fear it, the birds, the flowers, a beautiful evening in the end of April, a lovely night begun with the first nightingale and ended with the first swallow. Things which inspire the need and desire of happiness are as a stroke of fate to us. We still feel these charms, but we also feel that they are no longer for us. Youth, in all its vigour, enjoying them at our side and regarding us disdainfully, 
makes us envious and makes us better comprehend the extent of our desolation the the freshness and grace of nature recalling past felicity increase the hideousness of our misery we feel that we are but blots on this fair face of waters that we bring discord into her harmony and sweetness by our person by our woods and even by whatever feelings we venture to express we can still love but none can love us the fountain of spring has gushed forth without renewing our youth and the sight of nature's fresh life of all that is happy brings us back to the painful memory of past delight the packet in which i embarked was crowded with families of emigres on board i made acquaintance with monsieur Angon, a former colleague of my brother's in the parliament of brittany a man of wit and taste and one of whom i shall have but too much to say a naval officer was playing at chess in the captain's cabin i was so changed that he did not know me but i recognised Geril. we had not seen each other since we were at brest and were to separate at southampton i related my travels to him and he told me of his this young man born near me by the seashore embraced his earliest friend for the last time while rocked on the waves which are soon to be witnesses of his glorious death la madoria the genoese admiral having defeated the venetian fleet was told that his son had been killed throw him into the sea said the father after the manner of the romans as if he had said throw him to his victory Geril rose voluntarily from the waves into which he had precipitated himself only the better to show them his victory on their shore in the beginning of the sixth chapter of these memoirs i have given the certificate of my disembarkation at southampton after the voyage from jersey i landed in seventeen ninety three after my travels in the woods of america and my adventures in the camps of germany as a poor emigre in the country where now in eighteen twenty two i write these memoirs and enjoy the dignity of ambassador End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter eighteen london from april till september eighteen twenty two literary fund attic in holborn failure of my health visits to physicians emigres in london a society has been formed in london for rendering assistance to literary men english and foreign this society invited me to attend its annual meeting i considered it a duty to accept the invitation and to become a subscriber to its funds the chair was occupied on the occasion by his royal highness the duke of york on his right hand was seated the duke of somerset lords torrington and bolton whilst i was placed on his left there too i met my friend mr canning the poet orator and illustrious minister made a speech given in all the newspapers of the day which contains the following passage too complimentary to myself although the person of my noble friend the ambassador of france is but little known here his character and writings are well known throughout the whole of europe he began his career by an exposition of the principles of christianity he has continued it by defending those of monarchy and he has just arrived in this country to help to unite two states together by the common bonds of monarchical principles and christian virtues it is many years since mr canning himself a literary man took instructions in london on politics from mr pitt it is almost as long since i began in obscurity to write in the capital of england having both arrived at offices of great distinction we here were joined together in a society dedicated to the duty of giving aid to literary men in misfortune is it the affinity of our greatness or the relation of our sufferings which has brought us together what have the governor-general of india and the ambassador of france to do at a banquet of the suffering muses the men there seated are george canning and francis de chateaubriand remembering their past adversity and perhaps happiness they drank to the memory of homer reciting his verses for a morsel of bread had the literary fund existed when i arrived in london from southampton on the twenty first of may seventeen ninety three it would perhaps have paid the visits of my physician to the attic in holborn where my cousin la boetarde the son of my uncle de bedet had hired a lodging for me great stress was laid on the effects of a change of air in order to give me the strength necessary for a soldier's life but my health instead of being altered for the better declined my chest was affected i became thin and pale coughed frequently and breathed with difficulty i suffered from copious perspirations and spitting of blood my friends as poor as myself took me from physician to physician 
these hippocrateses kept this band of beggars waiting at their doors and then at the cost of a guinea fee informed me that i must submit to my illness with patience dr godwin well known for his skill in cases of drowning gained by experiments made on himself according to his directions behaved more generously he gave me his advice without fees but at the same time told me with that sternness which he employed towards himself that i might linger on some months perhaps a year or two provided i avoided every kind of fatigue do not reckon on a long life this was the sum of his consultations the certainty thus acquired of my approaching end by increasing the natural melancholy of my imagination gave me an incredible repose of mind this disposition of mind explains a passage in the remarks prefixed to the essai historique and also the following passage in the essay itself attacked by an illness which leaves me little hope i look upon objects with a tranquil eye the calm air of the two miss felt their traveller who is only a few days distant from its repose the bitterness of the reflection scattered through the essay will no longer excite surprise this work was written under a sentence of death in the time between judgment and execution a writer who thought himself on the verge of the grave amidst the bereavements of exile could not be supposed to look upon the world with a very smiling countenance the question was how to spend the days of grace granted me i might have been able to live or die quickly by the sword its use was forbidden me what then remained a pen unknown and untried and i was ignorant of its power would my innate taste for letters the poetry of my youth or the rough sketches of my travels suffice to draw the attention of the public the idea of a work upon revolutions comparatively considered suggested itself to my mind i dwelt upon it as a subject very appropriate to the feelings and interests of the day but who would undertake to publish a manuscript without any one to speak in its praise and during its composition how should i get my living though i might have only a few days longer to live yet it was necessary to have some means of support for this brief period my thirty louis already seriously broken in upon could not go very far and in addition to my own particular sufferings it was necessary to contribute to the common wants of my countrymen in exile my companions in london had all obtained more or less employment some were put into the coal trade others assisted by their wives engaged in making straw hats and others taught french with which they themselves were not thoroughly acquainted they were all in good spirits that like-mindedness which constitutes the great defect of our nation was at that moment changed into a virtue they laughed at fortune to her face that plundering goddess was ashamed to carry off that which no one would ask her to give back End of chapter 18